Thank you very much. Um, I feel eminently unqualified um, for this talk, and I saw an advertisement in The Age this week that referred to this lecture in the series that was to be given by Mark Baker. And it might have been more appropriate to have the Mark Baker, with whom I'm often confused in The Age, the foreign editor, because he's a commentator on foreign affairs, and sometimes our mail gets mixed up. Um, but um, as somebody who is a Jewish historian, um, there are many things that I want to engage with. The question is what I bring to this, and Gary Simpson spoke last week and talked about himself as an expert on law and asked the question what somebody with a legal background has to bring to this topic. And I look at the poster here, and a lot has been said and discussed about this um, poster that is um, being put together in a wonderful series relating to the Wednesday lectures, and Ray last week addressed it as well. And I ask myself where I fit into this series. Um, morality, I know that Ray is a moral philosopher, and also anyone who knows Ray and who's read Ray's book would know that it's more than just a professional badge that he wears, but is it's also um, as a human being. Um, I won't vouch for myself in that regard. Law, I don't have a legal background, and so it's difficult for me to say things about the legal questions that are associated with this topic, and politics, I'm not a political scientist, my background is in history. And as I look at that poster further, I see on the poster that it carries with it the colours around those words of the Palestinian flag. And then there is a picture of the Guernica about which much has been said, which symbolises the sufferings of the people whose name or territory is inscribed upon that poster, Gaza. And so the question is, where do I, as somebody who identifies with Zionism, and I want to talk about what that means, where do I fit into this poster and how do I respond? And as I look at it, I feel that my own identity and my relationship to the question perhaps is what is framing the way this lecture series is being offered. I don't know if it is deliberate, but the word Gaza is written with fuzzy blue and white colours, so maybe that is the presence of the Israeli flag on this poster, but clearly those who would talk about Israel in relation to the questions of Gaza, morality, law and politics would exist outside this poster as the people inflicting and um, what the image tries to depict and um, that of suffering. And I know that Ray has talked about the Guernica as a symbol of, of um, a universal symbol of anti-war sentiment, which is something that is deeply shared. But I also fear that in the context of the discussion about where Israel fits into this whole discussion, that it produces a kind of language and rhetoric that is invisible, that stands around it. And given that the specificity of the event depicted in this image relates to the German Luftwaffe, relates to the period of Nazi um, rule in 1937, and while it doesn't specifically belong to the period of the war and the Holocaust, nonetheless, there is more to this picture in terms of how it is read by many people and how I read myself into it that I find disturbing. And it's really that issue that I want to address today. It's the question, and I know that Gary mentioned it last week, how do we talk about Gaza? What kind of discursive frames do we introduce in our discussion on, on Gaza and the interrelationship of morality, law, and, and politics? And the starting point for what I want to say stems from a speech that was recently given, not the Netanyahu speech, about which I'll say something, but the speech by the United States President, Barack Obama, because I believe that that speech sets a new frame for talking about politics, which might have been perfectly obvious to many people, but I think it's a rupture with the way American foreign policy is being guided and how global politics is operated. And while it might project a utopian vision that doesn't square with the reality, it nonetheless sets a new agenda. And it's that agenda, and three points particularly, that I just want to introduce and talk about how that relates to the way I believe we should talk about Gaza and how the Gaza war emerged and how we talk about it after. So there's a lot that can be said about Obama's Cairo speech, but I think there are three main points that, for me, stand out. 
The first one is that the world has been governed ever since the turn of the last century by polarities, by axes that are divided. The world wars, and then the Cold War, which divided the world. And then we had in the early 90s various people beginning to introduce doctrines and theories that were at odds with each other. Fukuyama wrote the book, The End of History, in which he predicted that with the revolutions that took place across the Iron Curtain that divided the world into an East and Western sphere, that history had come to an end, that history had exhausted itself, perhaps with a whimper, but that ideologies had come to their end and as a result, a new universal enlightenment ideology of liberal democracy, stroke American democracy, is what would now govern the world. And even though in that theory there was a notion of a globalising ideology, nonetheless it carried within it a kind of polarising discourse about triumph, of one side being triumphant over another side, and that that would be the end result of all the divisions within the world throughout the 20th century. And at the same time as Fukuyama wrote this, Huntington wrote his famous treatise, The Clash of Civilizations, which, as I know Robert Mann, is, who was sitting here, wrote about the dangers of that becoming a self-fulfilling prophecy, that the very paradigm and ideology that is introduced that divides the world in this new way between civilizations that mirrors the Cold War division of the world, that that in itself would lead to a world that was politically divided. And certainly in the Bush era, as we know, the world has been governed in its war against terror, in a state of defining the world in which we live in perpetual war between two sides, an axis of evil, a crusade for good, in which Huntington's theory, the clash of civilizations, in a sense became the dominant paradigm through which American foreign policy and indeed the world was um, plunged and which fed the two sides in these, um, in these divisions. Obama's speech in Cairo not only announced the end of this doctrine of the clash of civilizations, but announced the end of this discourse of us versus them, of exclusive, exclusivity, of either or, they were one of his opening words to soften the audience, that the polarisation of politics in the world would not be between ideologies that were divided, but rather between, along a different axis, indeed, between radicals and moderates in each camp, but in which the boundaries that divided politics and different spheres and countries would no longer continue. And so that's one point that he introduced into world politics, that we should begin to talk about the world not in terms of us and them. And I want to talk about how that applies to my understanding of how we look at the Gaza war and how we address the issues that arise from it. The second point ar arising out of that is that the end of this polarising discourse, for Obama at least, was, the, was a reflection of the era of globalisation in which we live. And he gave numerous examples of the interconnectedness of politics from non-political spheres. The global financial crisis, for example. One company, Lehman Brothers, collapses and the whole world is in financial crisis. He talked about the swine flu starting in one country and immediately there is a pandemic. And he applied that to talk about the importance of a spirit of cooperation, of connectedness between people in solving regional conflicts and introduced into that discussion two things. The question of morality, he talked about the stain on our moral conscience that also becomes globalised, that we all share. And in addition to that, he introduced in this manner of thinking where categories weren't divided between us and them, he introduced for one of the first times by a president, 
history, something that is familiar to me. He talked about the burdens of history. He talked about the legacies of history. He used the word colonialism. He used the word imperialism. Some might say perhaps to appease, to apologise. A lot has been said about this speech and there have been critics of the speech. I received many emails all day. One of the emails today was titled Abomination, a play on abomination. But when I looked at it first, I thought it said Obama Nation, and that perhaps expresses the exact opposite. But he introduced in his speech the idea of nuance, of the grey zone, of looking at conflicts through the prism of history, not in simplistic ways, and recognising that the issues couldn't be divided into in this polarising way of virtue versus evil. And finally, relevant to what I want to say, there was a third point that I think is often missed in the speech, and that is that he repudiated the idea that has dominated in, a, in an escalating way since 9-11, the idea that religion and God is the cause of all problems. For some reason since 9-11, in fact it's perfectly explicable, and I'm not a philosopher, but philosophers have suddenly reintroduced into the public realm and become obsessively preoccupied with proving that God doesn't exist, or that God has an evil impact on the world, or that God is evil. There have been a spate of books, about ten books, that have been best sellers. The God Fallacy, um, the you know, Christopher Hitchens writing on atheism. Um, a whole range of books that posit that religion is the core problem in the world. And against that, or surrounding it, has been a new understanding of the world in which we live that Obama, I think, was grappling with. And it's what people call post-secularity. The idea that we are living in a secular world where we thought that with this universal enlightenment idea, this one idea that Fukuyama thought would be triumphant, that we would all be, um, we would all be proven wrong in our distinct, separate identities, that identity and the particularity of identities and particular religious identities would not persist into the 21st century. And what Obama did is he turned it on its head. And in all the quotes that he introduced from the Quran, from significantly, I think, the Talmud and not the Bible, a very, and, and a wink or a nod to the Jewish audience that was listening, that he takes the particularity of Jewish culture seriously and not just as a reflection of or a projection of a Christian view of Jews. And he quoted from the New Testament. And he used quotations to show that rather than religion, rather than specificity of identities. Rather than difference being the problem, it can become in a globalised world built on cooperation and partnership the solution. And I think that's a very important point. He took a strong stance on differentiating himself from France, which has adopted a non-neutral attitude towards its Muslim population, a, a, a radical enlightenment universalist idea of identity within France which goes back in fact to the Napoleonic era when Jews were also asked to prove how they can be different and French, same question being applied to Muslims. And Obama differentiated himself from that in his treatment of Muslims in America and how he understood that even the ideas of democracy which are about human rights and dignity do not have to implement themselves through one model. That particular cultures can mediate the ways democracy, equality, liberty, women's rights can be understood. And I think you, in, in his view of the role of religion, you see a very, again, all the elements being fused. The idea of dealing not in polarities, but with the complexity of issues, with an historical understanding of people's own experiences and an understanding that the ideals that perhaps all people share in common 
can enunciate themselves, can articulate themselves in many different ways. So how does this relate to Gaza? My argument or my belief that I want to present is that the way we talk about Gaza, the way Gaza was understood and how it emerged in reality on, I don't want to use the word theatre of war because to talk about theatricality in relation to human suffering is inappropriate, but how we understand the events that led to it and how we respond to it in part also um, is a product of this pre-Obama kind of discourse that people are still locked into. And Obama, I believe, not only throws a challenge to all the people that he addressed in Cairo, the so-called Muslim world, which many people have pointed out was problematic in the way he, he did talk in a collective way about Muslims without differentiating their own specificities, which his speech, one would expect, the doctrines would lead him to do. Um, the way he addressed the conflict between not just Palestinians, but he talked about Palestine quite deliberately and Israel, that all of this can be viewed through various prisons. And my argument is that we have been locked for too long inside paradigms that fuel this polarising discourse that can only lead us to catastrophe that can only lead us in this interconnected, globalised world to catastrophic outcomes in which the human suffering that is represented in this image will be further replicated and amplified. And one only needs to look at how the Gaza war has been talked about within Israel and in Palestine and in the international community to realise that people are locked inside either or paradigms with totally different understandings of what happened without any point of connection as if the wall that divides the border between Israel and a future Palestinian state um, was something that was erected inside people's heads. Even the wall itself is called different things by different people. You know, Palestinians will often talk about it being the apartheid wall. Israelis will talk about it being the security fence. And while one can produce an empirical understanding that would offer an appreciation of the different perspectives, the very fact that both sides are locked inside their paradigms and totally outside each other is part of the problem that continues to lead to this ongoing cycle of war that has prevented the possibility of a solution being reached, which I want to end this talk by saying is possible if certain preconditions are met. And I don't believe that we can talk about Gaza, and I don't want to talk about Gaza because my point is how should we talk about Gaza without talking about the end game, without talking about the larger conflict, without talking about the issues that surround it. The war from the Israeli side, and there was said to be a consensual a consensus position in relation to the war. And while there were critics of the war, and certainly critics after the first few days of it, for most Israelis, the war was about how do we react to our perception of a unilateral withdrawal from Gaza in which Israelis no longer occupy the territory of Gaza and what is given in return is rockets that the greenhouses that were left behind, rather than being used to build a future Gaza, were destroyed, and that the Hamas rule in Gaza was used in order to launch attacks and thereby make it impossible to conduct any future withdrawal from the West Bank, where the rockets would not only reach the border southern areas, the peripheral areas of Israel, but would reach Ben-Gurion Airport and Tel Aviv City. That was the meta-narrative that Israelis used. There was a lot more to it. There were all kinds of signals in the Israeli narrative that were being introduced into that whole you know, story. The guilt about the cafe-going Tel Aviv yuppies who didn't care for over a year, in fact five years, 
about the missiles that were traumatising the lives of people in the border areas of Gaza and places like Sterot and the belief that something had to be done. It was also related to signals that had to do with, I think perversely, with the election that was being held and the triumvirate who were trying to write themselves into history in particular ways, and it's getting into detail, you know, Tsipi Livni and Barak and, um, and, and, and his relationship to the past and Olmer who was trying to cleanse himself of the Lebanon war. It was a signal from Israelis' point of view of deterrence to Iran and the fears of Iran, as we know, becoming armed with nuclear weapons and what that would, and, and, what, and, and the threat associated with that to wipe Israel off the map. So from the Israeli perspective, that was the narrative, that was the understanding. And then you have totally on another, on the other side of the fence, a very different narrative which doesn't relate in any, in any way to the coordinates of how many Israelis understand their actions in Gaza. From, Palestine, from the Palestinian perspective, Gaza and the occupation in Gaza was experienced as a jail and the unilateral withdrawal that wasn't part of an overall peace agreement was simply an exercise in the jailer retreating on his own terms and taking the keys with him. So you have very different perspectives on the war and within that the fights as we all know between Hamas and, and, and Fatah, between the West Bank and, and Gaza about Arab, um, it, it, it was seen the way the, the war was fought from the Palestinian point of view as exemplifying in the face of the compromises made by, um, by the West Bank PA leadership, it was seen as ex exemplifying the Palestinian ethos of steadfastness, something which is very much part of the Palestinian narrative. And so what I'm suggesting is that there is no point of understanding of either side and that simply repeats itself on just about every issue. The Oslo Accords. You have two different narratives on what happened there. The version that is often given by Israel, which also feeds in, and this is my point, it feeds in to the perspective that leads to the operations in Gaza, that everything was offered on the table in 2000 and 2001 by Barak, and it was refused by Arafat, and in the face of that attempt, to try to offer a Palestinian state on the narrative is 96 or 97 percent of the West Bank and all of Gaza that the refusal has led instead to suicide bombing and after the Intifada to rockets using new technologies in Israel. And then you have another interpretation of the Oslo Accord which says no that's not what happened, it wasn't a matter of Arafat simply walking out that the offer wasn't a real offer, it didn't deal with the core issues, the law of return, it didn't deal sufficiently with, um, with Palestinian refugees and restitution, and in particular, the offer of the map was not what Israelis say the offer was, but it was what was called the, the, the Swiss cheese map of cantonised areas of the West Bank. Again, very different interpretations of what is happening. And so what I believe needs to be done and how we should be thinking about Gaza is to acknowledge the various discursive frames that lead to this kind of polarisation in which both sides are locked out of an understanding of the other's experiences and rather than becoming obsessed with questions of symmetry or cycle of violence or moral equivalence, all of these words that you hear on both sides of the argument. Rather than becoming obsessed with that, the question is how does one address what happened in Gaza? How does one understand what happened? <coughs> I'll come to that. And how does um, one move beyond it? So, in my view, there are four or five issues that need to be addressed. And we have to be careful about how we talk on these issues if we are to, um, to, to look beyond Gaza towards some kind of framework in which peace can emerge. The first one is the division, as I said, 
that Obama criticised of the characters of the parties to the conflict of being of in, into two teams, as you might call them, us and them, either or, and in particular to a language that regards both sides to the conflict as victors. Now, it might seem strange on many levels and for many people disturbing for those who identify with Zionism and for Israelis to regard themselves as righteous victims in this conflict. But that is one of the frames in which this conflict is understood and how Gaza was understood. You know, we are victims, we are receiving rockets, or we are victims, we have been you know, bombarded. And I'll come to the question of how you evaluate the, 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 those different perspectives. But this notion of both sides claiming the right to tag themselves as victims has a very long and very problematic history. 